Minda Wilson with Urgent Care. I'm excited to welcome my guest today, Jack Levine, founder of the Ford Generations Institute. Jack, welcome to the show. Thank you. A pleasure to be with you, Minda. Well, I mean, it's an interesting time with COVID because people are trying to maintain their family relationships in a time when it's being very hard to get together. So what, what, what are your thoughts on this and what do you think the best ways to keep up relations are in the time of COVID? Well, this is very personal for me and my wife, Charlotte, because we have a granddaughter who's two and a half years old, and she lives uh, in California, and we live in Florida. So we are uh, example number one of our great concern about the distance and the lack of ability to hug her and kiss her and, and be very personal with her face-to-face. We, of course, are taking advantage of every technical opportunity we can with FaceTime and Zoom, but obviously it's, it's not enough, and we're just one of tens of millions of grandparents around the country who are feeling more separate. Uh, we're fortunate to have technology, but some don't even have that capacity. So I know there are many, many stories to tell and many, many challenges to overcome, but for us on a personal level, what has happened is we have to find new ways of connecting that are not very satisfying, and we just don't know when this is going to end because we want to be safe and we don't want to infect anyone, and we certainly don't want to go through the rigors of a cross-country drive. So that's where we are, and we, we love our Julianne so much, but we don't get to touch her. So what are some of the things that you've, you've, you, you've connected on Zoom? So do you have a regular, do you set up a regular schedule so you get to talk to her? Are you homework helpers so that you're connected with her through schools? What, through school, what are some of the things that you've sort of undertaken to sort of build a relationship with her? Well, I won't say it's a, it's a regular schedule, but at least once or twice a week we are in touch via FaceTime and occasionally Zoom. Um, those are two devices that work very, very well for us. Of course, we have to watch the clock because it's a three-hour time difference between Pacific time and Eastern time. Uh, she's not old enough to be in school, but we do engage her on our best for full conversation. We ask her about her favorite new book, and sometimes she grabs it and, and tries to read part of it. Uh, she loves to cook and help our son, who is kind of the chief chef these days. And she talks about the ingredients. Uh, she loves making banana nut, banana nut uh, pancakes, which is banana <laughs> nut pancakes. And, um, you know, we're, we're delighted. And, uh, you know, gosh, there are so many struggles out there. I mean, in a, you know, when you add it up between our health professionals uh, and our service workers and our transportation workers. I mean, this is a time of, of tremendous high stress. And we do our best, and, and as an advocate, I do my best to be the most positive guy in the room because, you know, negativity is uh, contagious. And I know there are problems, but I think we also have to look at opportunities, just which are overall leadership was a lot stronger in helping us to find a way out of this without avoiding the facts. And, and sometimes I find our leaders are less than candid about the true depth of the, the problem that exists. And not to mention any names necessarily because there are a lot of levels to leadership. But, you know, I think we need to be very, very honest with the problem, and that will help us um, get to solutions. Every family has to make decisions about their own safety, but our leaders have to make decisions which are in the public good. I totally agree. So in that sense, um, you're talking about some of the some of the terrible consequences of this are, you know, a lack of connectedness, it leads to depression. Do you, do you have a do you have a any thoughts about how people can sort of better cope with the isolation that COVID is sort of 
Yes, well, I'm relying on my network members. I have a fairly extensive network through my four generations work, and uh, because I communicate with them on a about a twice a monthly basis through email and phone calls, um, I'm getting coached by them as to what they recommend. So I'm kind of the the uh, conveyor of their messages. Number one is to be personally healthy. You know, I think we have a tendency if we don't have to, you know, be at a place at a certain time because of limited transportation, I think we might get a little bit sloppy about, you know, how we, um, not only how we look, but, you know, how we take care of ourselves. I think regular exercise is very important. It's actually uh, very fruitful to have a garden if you have room for that, even a, a patio or backyard garden. I think it's very important to get out for regular movement and regular exercise because, you know, physical health and mental health are so integrally connected. I think our diet is very important. Again, you know, not to be too preachy, but, you know, when we're home so much, that refrigerator is like a frequent stopover. (laughs) And I think we have to be careful of what we consume, how much we consume, and, again, measure our our um, our amounts, our portions, not to have that second and third helping if we're not hungry anymore. The other thing that is important, I think, for our overall well-being is to be helpful to others. You know, there's science out there that says when we help others, whether through some volunteer work and helping to staff a food bank or to check in on elder neighbors who may need some help with their own grass cutting or yard work or some, you know, light maintenance, it really is very fulfilling. So it's this mutuality that I think we have to get to at a, at a more frequent and almost habitual level. And I like to send the signals to our young people to be examples to them. Again, young people sometimes are too sedentary. They're too screen-oriented. And I think we need to kind of get out there in the fresh air with them and show them some nature and show them some enjoyable um, you know, walks and hikes and activities and, and you know, if, if, if Frisbee or soccer or whatever our, our inclinations are. So I just think we have to have common sense as we make our way through this terrible, terrible, stressful time. Mm-hmm. So common sense means taking care of your personal nature, but what about, how, are, are, there, are there interactions like, uh, for example, Zoom book clubs or, you know, things things that are out there that people might not be aware of that they can sort of find online to sort of engage in. Yes, well, again, the, the wonderful world of Google or any other search engine gives us access to so many resources. And I think we need to keep up with our our local publications, whether it be a community newspaper or a community magazine that gives offerings of activities, again, we don't have to feel imprisoned. And, and I think the reality is that if we take precautions, if we keep our distance, uh, we can go to small group sessions and discuss books or literature. We can even talk politics as long as it's not too uh, filled with venom. And I think we also have to have the opportunity to, uh, you know, enjoy, enjoy the um, – the, the, the communication across the generations. You know, I think it's very important to maybe do some family history uh, at this time, and we can even do that by phone or by Zoom. Um, I have a wonderful publication I'd be glad to send people for free called The 100 Best Questions to Ask Our Ancestors, and that doesn't have to be, you know, um, uh, people who are, are proximate to us. And it can tell the story of our family's immigration. It can tell the story of our family's uh, activities when they were growing up, and that's very valuable for family history. So, you know, I, I like to give ideas. I only make suggestions, but I hope, you know, people see them as opportunities to, to uh, do a little bit better with, with, with our communication. And, and there are ways you can connect um, you know, for those people that aren't necessarily technically savvy, there there's support for for those kind of people to help get connected. Is that is that right? 
Oh, oh, absolutely. And again, uh, you know, because I'm an intergenerational guy, I, I think it'd be wonderful if we had a, 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 a bit more programming for some teenagers to help elders, of course, with, with the proper masking and all of that, to navigate um, their own devices. Mm-hmm. I know I have this delightful 75-year-old first cousin who is uh, pretty new to computers. It's just been a couple of years for her. And yet um, she's, she's enjoying it tremendously. She is finding some of her high school buddies, you know, from, from 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And uh, she, she smiles greatly. And, she, and I'm reminded about something else that she did. About two years ago she decided, because she lives alone, to get a rescue animal, a cute little dog. And that has really changed her life for the better because it's not only a he is not only a companion, but it gives her a regularity of caretaking and walking and really moving that. So I think now is the best time to consider sharing our residence with a, with a pet. Yeah, so, so I understand that it's the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, I mean, that's made a big difference in the life of families as well. So how, how do you see, I mean... So what's your, so talk to us about the timeline and how it's impacted the lives of families. Well, you know, it is, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing when we have um, an ability to help folks who have challenges. And I speak personally about this because my father was a blind man. Now, he wasn't blind his whole life. He turned blind in his early 50s, but I actually came along when he was 60, which proves that... Uh, Vision is not necessary for all bodily functions. <laughs> mm-hmm. I hope people take that uh, little little joke positively. Um, so I grew up helping my father. I was his reader. I was his leader. My my right arm, you know, helped him navigate. He had a cane, but still, you know, he needed companionship sometimes uh, in unfamiliar places. And um, in you know, in those days, um, back in the 1950s and 60s. I would say that folks with certain disabilities had to make do. You know, we, we didn't have curbs that were friendly to people who had wheelchair um, uh, utilization. You know, we, we didn't have um, the proper educational opportunities for certain people with certain kinds of physical or even emotional disabilities. And, you know, it took a civil rights movement uh, not unlike other civil rights movements, to say we have to judge fairness by what we afford not only those who are in the mainstream, you know, so-called normal, which I think is a weird word about it, but without certain challenges. And there's another piece of this, which is it's a way of honoring our veterans. We have many, many who fought the battle, who came back with disabilities. And these, again, are a combination of forces that need to have people back to some level of productivity, not only for self-esteem, but for the economy and for their families. So there are many, many causes of disabling conditions. Some are by birth, some are by um, preventable accidents that happen, unfortunately, in automobiles and, and and household tragedies. But we also have our dear and hopefully respected veterans so, yes, the 30 years have been uh, a triumph. There's always a, uh, a need for uh, recognizing that ADA needs to be enforced like any other law. But more and more of our businesses and our government agencies and our facilities are becoming more and more uh, disabled friendly. And uh, do you think I think it, that's it, a cause. Do you think it's changed the perception of people with disabilities? Oh, without, without a doubt. I mean, the idea of, of, of people only, you know, having this kind of, you know, p- pity-like communication or like when we, we would go to a restaurant with my father, sometimes the server would talk real loud, <laughs> realizing that my father was blind. And, you know, he, he always said this with a smile on his face, and he says, I can't see you, but I can hear you very well, my dear. And, uh, you know, it's just that, that whole question of learning how they, quote, they are people, too, with all the same kind of emotions and sensitivities and in, intel, intellectual abilities, 
So, uh, you know, I think, I think it, we've come a long way. And, and I'm smiling broadly about this because you're bringing back some memories about how it was to be a child with a blind father and, and realizing the, the respect that, that he deserved. And and do you so now you feel like there people would not react in the same way that culture has changed so that people are you know they're not staring anymore they're uh, more you know they're they're they have a comfortable place in the workplace you know well yes again you know um, back in the early part of this of the of the you know twentieth uh, century. Um, uh, it was it was normal procedure to lock lock people with disabilities away in institutions. They were basically imprisoned by their own disabilities, and that was that was normal. I mean, children were taken away from parents because th- there was no instruction or no capacity to help them care for their children. I mean, th- you know, we think about that as kind of a middle ages kind of approach, but it wasn't. Uh, it, it, it was going on uh, decade after decade, and and we have uh, definitely made strides. Uh, that's not only um, an, eth- an ethical problem that we have overcome, but I think it, it's a societal um, uh, point of progress that we respect people much more. And across you know across the the range of so-called disabilities, we have now a more ability focus. And and I'm amazed. I'm amazed at, at, at the achievements of some of our um, disabled others. I mean, let's look at Stephen Hawking as an example of someone with just this phenomenal, phenomenal physical and neurological problem being one of the geniuses of the world. And I think to some degree we all have a, a measure of um, respect for that kind of, of genius. Amazing. That's true. That's true. So do you feel that, what do you feel is needed going forward? Like what changes would you like to see in the next 30 years? Well, you know, prevention is the best medicine. That's a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. Um, Keeping bad things from happening is my definition of prevention. And I think we have to have more and more research as to the prevention of uh, birth-related disabilities. Uh, Again, that has to do with um, better access to full prenatal care, uh, a reduction of use of alcohol and drugs, certainly smoking, any kind of disabling um, behavior by a pregnant woman or in the environment of a pregnant woman really will reduce certain types of disabilities that can result from, you know, both low birth weight or uh, other neurological problems. So I say the earlier the better. I also think another point of progress is to have our young children who have challenges to have greater access to specialized education. We shouldn't wait until kindergarten. We we now have devices and techniques and teaching abilities for children who are, you know, one, two, and three years old to learn a great deal about um, the the maneuvering of, um, of devices and the ability to learn even though they have uh, physical or, or or visual or auditory challenges. So, I mean, we've made progress um, in research, and I think, you know, my byword for all of that is the sooner the better, the earlier the better. When it comes to kids, it's not whether we pay, it's when. And earlier investments pay great dividends. Well, now with a lot of kids at home, you're you're starting to see a tug of war in families, you know, about resources and educating kids from with working parents sitting in the same home. How how do you how do you see schooling and educating working if kids aren't actually going to school? Well, that is our, our one of our great dilemmas and actual challenges as we speak. Um, you know. Um, the the prevalence of 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 the virus uh, and the uh, the new uh, realities that we've been learning only in the last couple of months is is that children are not only susceptible to this virus but they are very potent carriers of this virus. So they may not be showing symptoms, but they can back, basically uh, infect 
uh, others around them, and that that's a that's a shocking but true assessment of the current situation. So therefore, I'm very very concerned about reopening the schools too greatly, uh, without some level of understanding of the implications of that. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have uh, opportunities for parents or other caregivers to work. And that's the great imbalance here between what needs to be done for the economy, but also what needs to be done for family income and who's taking care of the children. So, you know, I think we have to have a smarter approach than just saying yes or no, but, but create intermediary opportunities. So, for example, if we have children who, um, you know, have the, the, the correct technologies in their homes, to be uh, able to, to uh, learn remotely, we call it, or virtually is the other word for it, then I think that needs to be uh, expended as part of our um, overall education budget. I mean, in other words, if, if, if we're not educating the children within the, the confinement of classrooms and schools, maybe some of the resources need to go to supplement the ability of the parent or the, the caregiver to have the devices uh, afford the internet and allow these children to have access to the world of remote learning. Um, you know, a, a lot of this has been accelerated, of course, because of the need, but now more than ever, I think we have to look very, very carefully at what our options are because, uh, again, losing a year or two of advanced learning is a very, very precarious position for children to be in. Uh, you know, children should not only be um, fed um, good nutrition and given an exercise and the ability to use their bodies, but they have to use their minds or else there's not going to be a positive future for them. Exactly. And so, so what, so there's a con, so parents are being pulled. They're working at home. They have an obligation to their employer. They have their children who, who need stimulation and attention what what's your what's your best advice for that what how do you how do you manage that well you're not speaking to a wizard <laughs> uh you you're speaking to someone who has to put the pieces together and give policy options to people who are making those decisions mm -hmm. resources have to be invested and and in other words you know if a family uh, does not have the basics of a safe place to live, um, access to regular nutritious food, um, uh, access to technology, as we just mentioned, then there's going to be a, a greater challenge. And, you know, I think now more than ever, we have to look at the possibilities that this is not in the short term. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. I'm, I'm the biggest optimist in most rooms that I that I go to, but this is, this is not a short-term problem. This is a longer-term problem that we need greater solutions. So, for example, uh, I think that um, the, the ability of children to communicate, uh, again, via virtual, which would mean, you know, online, needs to be expanded to not only curriculum but to artistic pursuits. I think children can... Uh, learn a whole lot about music and the arts, both the performance arts as well as the visual arts, from interesting programming that we could establish for families and for children. Again, the usual curriculum of mathematics and science and literacy are very important, but you know, more and more our schools have pulled away from artistic education, and I think that's a problem. So, you know, here again, um, you know, I don't want to be a naysayer, but we've got to have some very, very smart minds coming together. And usually uh, a, an answer, a simple answer to a complex problem is almost always wrong. And what I mean is complicated problems require a multiplicity of smart solutions. A lot has to do with resources. A lot has to do with our ability to afford quality, and we have to make that decision. Makes sense to me. 
So in terms of policy, um, we need to figure out how to, I mean, think of the life of a, of a set six-year-old kid or a seven-year-old kid. At that point in their life, typically they would be in school, they would be running around a playground, they would be learning how to read, they'd be drawing, doing some art projects, they get at least one really good meal at school, even if the situation at home was not so good, and school would provide a stable place where they could go and and be for most of their day. So now we're saying that that place is closed. So you now have have no place to go. You now have you now unless something happens don't have the ability to be connected with your friends. You don't have the ability to run around. We aren't going to provide you the education unless you have access to technology. So essentially we're we're creating a situation where kids in that position are are in danger of of really being injured by something that's being done to try to protect their their health and the health of their families. So I think I think we have to provide a substitute, as you pointed out, for the loss of those very important essential parts of their lives. And that's what you're saying, correct? Yes, I'm saying that in this environment, we have to look medically at every opportunity to stem the tide of this horrible international, but there's something about the United States that has created, we are, you know, unfortunately, number one in the proliferation of this virus. Uh, the deaths are mounting. Um, you know, we have to get about the business of, you know, reducing the risk, uh, uh, go full fledge into um, the, the vaccine that everyone is, is so craving for. So, you know, we can't take our eyes off of, of those essential medical services. But at the same time, and I'm going to get a bit controversial here, um, there may be some expenditures of public monies these days that may have to be put on hold. I would give an example of I'm not so sure about Mars exploration at this point. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a scientific interest. Um, I, I know that there are many people who are uh, economically and uh, intellectually fascinated by what is or is not on Mars. But, you know, I think we need to look down the street and realize that a child who does not have proper supervision uh, is really not benefiting from, you know, a Mars exploration. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we could afford both, uh, let's have it. But I think we have to prioritize that. And, you know, I'll just give, you know, one, one other example is, you know, I think we have to be very, very cautious about, you know, how we spend our, when we spend our money on certain kinds of, you know, mass entertainment. I mean, again, I know people, you know, absolutely love the, the fantastic um, production of of these wonderful um, you know superhero movies and 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 everything that goes into creating this wonder and awe, but you know what? There are lots of children who need real superheroes in their lives, not just fake ones on the screen. And you know maybe the forty five million dollar production that goes into certain of our entertainment features needs to go into some much more concrete. And, and usable products for our children. Now, again, I, I preface that by saying I, I know that's controversial, it's debatable, but I think priorities are important, and we have to figure out you know, who we want to be and what we want to um, invest in, especially in the short term. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's all priorities, and it's all, it's all, it's all making wise choices. You know, and that's one of the things we need to teach, teach ourselves and, and, and understand as society. So if people want to reach out to you and, uh, and, uh, and find out more about your organization, what is the best way for them to do that? 
Okay, well, I, I do send a, a regular message to about twice a month, uh, and uh, the best way actually to reach me is, uh, is seems old-fashioned, but it's good old email. It's a very easy email address. It comes right to me. It's my first name, Jack, J-A-C-K, at four, that's number four, Jen, mm-hmm. dot org. Jack mm-hmm. at four, Jen, dot org. All I need is name and location and email, and uh, I'll get them um, into my network. Um, the reason geography is important is because frequently I, I, I learn about opportunities that are much more localized that I could pass on to my network members. So my directory is name, email, and geography, and that's very important. I'm affiliated with Grand Magazine, which is grandmagazine.com. I do a regular blog for that publication. It is targeted for grandparents, but it's really for every generation because I call it for grandparents and people who love them. And I know your uh, radio network has a a dimension of uh, activity with Grand Magazine. And the other way to uh, get in touch with me, frankly, is, you know, um, I can schedule, you know, phone calls or Zoom sessions on teaching advocacy and teaching the value of prevention because, at this point, um, I'm, I'm very, very excited about making new friends and keeping the ones I've already maintained over the, over the decades. And, and I have one more question. Um, what about, uh, in terms of opportunities for senior, what about Corp 2020? Well, Corp 2020 is really an intergenerational initiative. Um, you know, we have National Community Service, which is AmeriCorps, Senior Corps, foster grandparents, as well as what we call VISTA. These are programs that have been built up over the decades, and there's a very important piece of legislation, very bipartisan, that's going to be um, debated over the next few months, which would expand the resources for bringing more people into community service. So they're really not technically volunteers because there is a stipend. And, again, I can speak personally about this because our younger son, Josh, uh, invested two years in AmeriCorps service. And he, um, he blossomed during that. This was after his college degree was already completed. Uh, learned a tremendous amount about public health, uh, a tremendous amount about uh, nutrition, and that was really his path to his career, which is in public health. And he also happened to meet his his sweetheart, his wife, and now the mother of his daughter uh, through community service. So common interests sometimes bring more than just professional futures. Sometimes it becomes more romantic and personal. So um, the, uh, the 2020 core is a piece of legislation that I can provide information about. Again, all I need is a quick email, jacket4gen.org, and that will be easily sent out. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on the show. It, uh, as always, it's been a great pleasure talking to you. And um, this is Minda Wilson for Urgent Care.